Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hello, dear listener. This is Brett, and this is part two. Please make sure you caught part one in Scott and Carl's discussion of Lysander Spooner's essay from No Treason. This is number six, The Constitution of No Authority, written in 1870. A couple of quick notes before we get started here. As you know, there were some audio problems in the first show. The recording skipped over parts of Scott and Carl, so I had to fix that. But occasionally, Scott would be reading a quote from the Constitution of No Authority, and this would happen, and and I didn't want the show to be filled with uh, misquotes. So there's a couple of times where I'm actually going to jump in and just read the quote for you for clarity and completeness. Uh, also, I want to say thank you to Scott and Carl for their recognition in this show. These guys talk about a lot of Bretts, but I was the one that they mentioned today, and I was grateful for that. As always, I'm grateful to be a part of this great production. So here we go. The Constitution of No Authority by Lysander Spooner, Part 2. Thank you for your time and attention. So if you are a supporter of the Constitution, he thinks you're either a knave, a dupe, or a class which has some appreciation of the evils of government, but either do not see how to get rid of them or do not choose to so far sacrifice their private interest as to give them seriously and earnestly to the work of making a change. So you are a knave, which means you, what is a knave? A bad person. That a numerous and active class who see in the government an instrument which they can use for their own aggrandizement or wealth. Checks out. Uh, so... Yeah, there's a lot of money to be made uh, if you go along and you know the right people. Um, take the ticket is the word you use. Uh, the dupes would be, let's see, how does he describe them? Conservatives? A large class, no doubt, each of whom, because he has allowed one voice out of millions in deciding what he may do with his own person and his own property, and because he's permitted to have the same voice in robbing, enslaving, and murdering others that others have in robbing, enslaving, and murdering himself, is stupid enough to imagine that he is a free man, a sovereign, that this is a free government, a government of equal rights, the best government on earth, and such like absurdities. So the dupes would be, um, the internet calls them now midwits. You know, IQ from 95 to 105, who are not as smart as they think they are, and say, yeah, it's a free country. After all, this is America. And then the third class, you, you recognize it, but you haven't figured out what to do about it. Yeah. I think that's right. Very people that are knaves, don't know what they're messing with, or are wide-eyed about it, but helpless. I think that's right. Yeah, this is a hard book. Section three, taxes. He says that you're essentially being robbed. I mean, this is the libertarian argument. You know, ta taxation is slavery, action is robbery. Paying taxes is not a consensual act. Even if you do consent, a libertarian say, there's a gun in the room. He's pretty much making all those arguments. He says, if he refuses to comply, this is on page 14, Carl, government will seize and sell enough of his property to pay not only our demands, but... All your own expenses and trouble besides, if you resist the seizure of his property, call upon the bystanders to help you. So he's saying, uh, why don't you try this? Call upon bystanders to help you. Doubtless some of them will prove to be members of our band. And if in defending his property, he should kill any of our band who is assisting you, capture him at all hazards, charge him in one of our courts with murder, convict him and hang him. If he should call upon his neighbors or any others who, like him, may be disposed to resist our demands, and they should come in large numbers and cry out that they are bulls and traitors, that our country is in danger, call upon the commander of our hired murderers, tell him to quell the rebellion and save the country, cost what it may, tell him to kill all who resist, though they should be hundreds of thousands, and thus strike terror into all others similarly disposed. See that the work of murder is thoroughly done, that we may have no further trouble of this kind." 
when these traders shall have been thus taught our strength, they will be good, loyal citizens for many years and pay their taxes without a why or a where. Hmm, what's he talking about? Yep. Yeah, so he just got out of the Civil War, and he describes it in his little parable, whatever. And you know what I wrote in the, in the, call, in the, in the margin here next to this? Because he says, when these traders have thus been taught our strength and our determination, they will be good, loyal citizens for many years and pay their taxes. I wrote, is it time for another? Do governments require uprisings to quell in order to maintain a peaceful citizenry? Do they require that? Oh, I don't know. Uh, If you have his understanding of governments as contractual, the Civil War makes no sense. Because how could you compel someone to stay in an organization which he freely joined? Which is the puzzle. If, if states wanted to secede, why couldn't they secede? Leave out the question of slavery. Uh, I know that complicates all of this. But if South Carolina wants to secede, why can't they? Well, it turns out that government is not contractual. Government is not contractual. Government is based in violence. All of them. And if you're a part of it, you can't leave it. It makes much more sense if you realize that the, the consent is, is, is made up. That it's always monarchy or oligarchy. You just don't know who it is. Uh, and I'm sorry if that's a, a black pill. I, I wish it weren't the way it is, but I think that's the way it is. If it's a, a legal contractual thing, you know. So you should just say, yeah, I think you're right. People join something freely, they should be able to leave freely if, in fact, it's a free thing that they're joining. If they can't freely leave, then it is not a free thing that they're joining. And so this all makes much more sense if you if you think that government is, in fact, based in violence, that it's always a monarchy or oligarchy. You just might not know who the oligarchs are. You know, it's a nice story that that you get together and decide on a government, but I never decided. I would have had it be different. And the thing is, unless you're one of these men of power, you don't get to decide. Right? I mean, unless you're Genghis Khan, blow through blow through, and institute a new government, you don't get to decide. Nobody ever does. The midwits are written space in my head today, Carl. So I, I hope that the midwits listen to this and don't think that this is strictly, at least for me anyway, strictly an indictment of the United States government. It is that, but it's also it also points out that there's really no way for anyone to consent to be governed ever. Is there? Like, what would proper consent look like to effective government? Uh, proper consent to be governed. Well, I could consent to be governed. I am part of the Online great books, state, such as it is. And I consent to follow the rules and to show up at seminars and do what I'm tasked to do and, you know, participate in Slack and and do all of that stuff. I can't bind my children to that. No, but the scope of online great books isn't enough for that to be a good analogy, I don't think. Well, I don't think it's a good analogy. I think the degree to which you consent is the, well, Spooner's argument, it's the, it's the contract. Government ha- doesn't have anything to do with contracts. That's the thing. That's where he's wrong, I guess. Right. I, I, think, that's, I think that's right. You know, he, he says, well, the Constitution isn't a contract. He's right about that. But underlying all of this is, is he wants the contract. Like, you know, he wants to sign on the mm-hmm. dotted line and, and whatever. It doesn't work like that. I mean, game theory tells us that a certain number of people are not going to sign, they're not going to pay taxes, and they're going to take advantage of the benefits provided by those who do consent, can, uh, who consent to it. Um, that those then who, uh, who consented and are essentially paying the price of government, both in money and in labor and so on, will eventually use that power to have the free riders then participate. And free rider can be broadly defined. Well, you drink out of the water fountain that the government plumbed in in the city square when you were passing through that day. 
pay up. You can't be a free rider. And so you you always end you always mm-hmm. back in this in this situation where the government uses coercion to hold the thing together. The government by consent just it's just a lie. It's just a lie everywhere. And and maybe that's okay. I I just want him to call it what it is. You know, like hey, uh, hey, uh, citizen. So, so, how did the government of England arise? Well, in 1066, a Frenchman crossed the Channel and kicked the shit out of uh, some Anglo-Saxons and seized the land, seized the territory. Had the organizational skills and the resources to roll out his loyal followers to manage and govern all the lands and and uh, collect taxes. And in exchange for collecting those taxes, he provided some value to those people. Some. Operated some courts, uh, kept the Vikings away, uh, adjudicated you know disagreements among them, and mended some money, and protected them from the pesky Irish. <laughs> Has anybody ever had to be protected from the Irish? Uh, in, a, in protection from, you know, other, the Irish. other states. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so it was violence. It was Battle of Hastings. Uh, we have a peaceful revolution every time, every four years when we have... No, you're a retard. Stop. Please stop. Drink some Drano. I'm I'm tired of it. We can't have nice things with you people. Recognizing the the truth that government ultimately, you know, depends on who has the the violence. It could be a good thing. It could be the scales falling off your eyes. Yeah. I mean, see it for what it is, and then you can deal with it as it is. Yeah. Uh, uh, My second amendment. That right there, see, because we have the right to bear arms, that means that they're accountable and they have to in ways that we consent to. Otherwise, we'll 70, 1776 their asses, bro. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, good luck with that. It hasn't ever happened. Uh, when it did happen, there was, you know, this was 1861. And uh, lots of violence happened. Yeah, 1861 overturned the Second Amendment. One thing that 1861 shows is that the myth, and I think Spooner living through it, shows is that the contractual understanding of the Constitution is the wrong one. If it was contractual, then... Uh, leave aside the question of slavery. You have to leave aside the question of slavery. If you're going to say slavery justifies uh, the violence that happened in order to get rid of slavery, one, that wasn't the motive at the beginning, but that means that injustice anywhere justifies violence anywhere. So we got a lot of invasions to plan then. So th- I think that's a dead end. It does muddy the waters on this question, but it's states that freely entered and were not allowed to freely leave. You know, when you walk into, when you, when you meet the Godfather and he says, I want you to do something for me. It's a terrible imitation. And uh, at some point I will ask you a favor. And then he asks the favor and you say, I don't want to do it, and you find out that you can't not do it, you realize it wasn't a favor. You realize that <laughs> you were you were coming under his protection and rule at that point. And that's what the, the, the Civil War points out about this country, is that it's not consent of the governed. It's a nice dream, but it wasn't consent of the governed. As one of our Slack people will say, Is Jefferson's use of consent of the governed, does he believe it or is it rhetoric? We had some lengthy arguments on our our Slack channel about that. I think they've cooled off a bit. But uh, I don't know. It's a good question. I would love it to be true. 
I would love it to be true that governments derive their power from the from the consent of the governed. But I'd love a lot of things to be true. There are a few things that the Enlightenment gave us that are not true and have just damn near ruined it all. Uh, the idea of natural rights is one of them. That consent of the governed really it kind of flows from the idea of natural rights and that you can kind of you can abrogate them consensually to a democratic government that will then adjudicate them properly. And it's just you know there are no there's no natural the idea of natural rights is is bogus. That whole social contract theory thing is bogus. We don't have to do our work in this show on that. But uh, if you assume those things, you get weird stuff like what we have, and you get weird stuff like. Um, the Civil War. Civil wars happen. They happened prior to Locke and Hume and Rousseau. <laughs> that was a quelled revolution. The Confederate States of America did not try to seize power from Washington. That's true. Uh, civil, That's true. You know, they, they you know there was no uh, Confederate uh, Caesar who crossed the Ron to wrest power away from the establishment. It was not a civil war. Although they did fire. They did shoot first. Because they were occupied. But whatever. Because <laughs> uh, Lincoln's cabinet member promised them that they would evacuate Fort Sumter, and then they didn't. Um, so. Yeah, good times. What a pain in the ass. Four, <laughs> page 16. <laughs> All political power, as it is called, rests practically up a matter of money. Any scoundrels having money enough to start with can establish themselves as a government because with money they can hire soldiers and with soldiers extort more money and also compel general obedience to their will. It is with government, as Caesar said, it was in war, that money and soldiers mutually supported each other. I'm very interested in the, the, this idea. I think Caesar is at least partly right. I, I wonder, I wonder if, if the government derives its power from money. You know, I mean, he's saying that government derives its power from force and money. With money, he can get the force. With the force, he can get the money. You know, I mean, what is money? A fun fact, the word for money in Latin is a, it's from the word for cow. Pecus, P-E-C-U-S. If you have the resources, you can support the violence, which will get you the resources. Which comes first, I don't know. If you're William the Conqueror, you can start minting money and solidify, you know, your position. Um, but you're, if you're George Soros and you've got money, you can hire some William the Conquerors. I don't think that it, there's a natural priority there necessarily. Although maybe there is. Like, like you know, let's let maybe we go back into the mists of of history. Somebody uh, used the sword, or maybe a rock. <laughs> And, uh, you know, was willing to hit people in the head with that rock unless they gave that Ragnar uh, food. Maybe it, maybe it mm -hmm. is all violence. I don't know. Okay, so to the shock of nobody, I will go back to the Republic. The beginning of the Republic is this contest between justice being the will of the stronger and justice being something else. And I really want Socrates to be right. I really want justice to be something else. And uh, the way he makes his argument is that uh, the tyrant, the one who lives by violence, is actually not happy. That his soul is disordered, that his life is no good, that he has no friends, that, that it is a better life to be just than it is to be unjust. I think think that's right but how can you make that governmental policy only if everybody believes that which is the whole thing with the philosopher king and you have to have a very small government not government a very small governed territory a very small nation and it has to be a nation not a country there can't be, uh, the, among the governed, there can't be much dissent. Wait a minute. Among the governed, 
you ha- you can't have there can't be much differing opinion. Well, and you're less likely to to rob, steal, and murder your friends. Rob and steal are the same thing. What his trio, whatever his trio was. Robbers, tyrants, murderers. Oh, that's another reason I like the monarchy. The monarchy in some, in a clear-eyed way, the serfs as his property. Yeah. At, and he has a long-term view. As a long-term view, he has a property right in the governed, in those who are governed. And when, when he's at his best, um, wants to manage that property for the benefit of his grandchildren, his monarchy ends up looking like extended family group. Bad mm-hmm. monarchs are bad. Mm-hmm. But all bad government is bad. We can ignore that because all bad government is bad. In the monarchy, the virtuous philosopher king has full agency. The heights of this possible in the monarchy are far greater than that in the republic or the oligarchy or any other. Well, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going from Spooner back to Socrates. He does say democracy is more fun. It shines brightly. But one of the things that it does, one of the things that it does is it makes vice lucrative. Because you can get people to vote where their vices are. And so it's a tool, it's a wedge. If you need to get people to vote, you need ways to get them to vote your way. And the vices are a good way to get them to vote your way. Is it gorgeous so, that he says that the purpose of government is the improving of the people? He says it a few places. Protagoras may purpose of good government, but the purpose of democracy is not that. So the monarch, he's got his majesty's ships, his majesty's army, his majesty's hammer, but he sees this, the, the country... And the citizens, as his property, it would behoove the wise monarch to do what he could to improve those people in virtue, in virtue, in industry, in responsibility, in all things. And he doesn't have to seek re-election. He doesn't have to buy anyone's approval. Yeah. Yeah. I know people don't want to believe that, but you can't have you can't have a Charlemagne if he has to run for re-election every four years. Well, everybody, uh, uh, everybody who complains about the quality of the people running for office, you know, and say like it's the politicians' fault. No, I don't think so. I think I think it's systemic. If you have to get votes, I mean, uh, Chesterton said once that the problem with millionaires isn't. And million, a million was a lot of money back then. Uh, isn't that they're millionaires? It's the sorts of people they have to be to be millionaires. You know that they have to care about that stuff a lot. What sort of a person do you have to be to get in office in under the United States Constitution? Well, you could just look. There's 435. What whatever the people in the Congress. What is it? 435. So there's 535 of them up on Capitol Hill. How many of them do you like? How many of them are of good character? If you, dear listener, think there's not a whole lot of them of great character, why is that so? Why are they there then? Oh, because the people are morons. No, it, it, it might not even be that. It might be that the system is such that these are the people who succeed in it. As Brett would say... On his podcast, there are perverse incentives. There's incentives to be like that. By the way, Brett just wrapped up the uh, School Sucks podcast run. I know, it's a gap in my podcasting. Um, That's a sad day. Um, I listened to the last Mm -hmm. show. It was kind of hard to do. It was hard to do. That show has been meant a whole lot to me. The School Sucks podcast, and not, not I was a big fan of that show before Brett came and started working with us. Uh, I would work with us because because of what I had heard there. I knew he was a good guy and he did good work, and um, that we would work well together. And that's been true. It's not gone. You can still go download those shows and 
and more people will find that over the years. It'll be there for a long, long time for download and for new people to stumble on. But um, yeah, it's it's sad. I know it's good for Brad. He's got other things he's going to work on, and he's said the things he needs to say. Just like when I bowed out of the Barbell Logic, I had said most of the things I needed to say about squats. Um, and he had said most of the things that he wanted to say about that. And he, and he did it for, I think, 12 years. But, uh, hey, Brett, thank you for doing that. And, uh, best of luck in all that, all this, and all this new stuff you're going to, you're going to try. No, yeah. not going to try that. You're going to do sign. Yeah. Ugh. I agree. It's tough. I missed the show. His music selections were good. Yeah. Tasty show. Well, there'll be news coming from Brett. There'll be new things. More of Lysander's bogus idea about the contract. Um, section four, it is a general principle of law and reason that a written instrument binds no one until he has signed it. Okay. I mean, sure. Okay. At this point, so at this point, I'm thinking, fine, I get it. As a contract, it is not a contract. Okay. What are the alternatives? You know, uh, you and I are playing around with monarchism. That's not what he does. Mono, one ruler. Don't see Denmark it's being ruled by the people. Um, he's an anarch without without ruler. Mm -hmm. That's what he proposes, except it doesn't work. And really, none of these things do. You know, Aristotle in his politics tells us in Book Five all the sources of revolution, and that through the various sources of revolution that he describes there, that governments evolve. And I can't remember what those government types are and what the order of them is, but the, they devolve and you end up with democracy and then a tyranny. Every That's his theory of history. There are people, other people have other theories, but his theory of, you know, political history. Can you, can you have a, mon a monarchy and keep it? You can't have anarchy and keep it. We've shown it because where, where are the anarchies? There aren't any. They always evolve into something else and then progress um, all the way through to tyranny. Yep. Well, I want to find some positives. I like the idea on 23, page 23. So Constitution, Article 1, Section 6 provides that for any speech or debate or vote in either house, they, the senators and representatives, shall not be questioned in any other place which he takes to mean, and I, I guess it does mean this, that you are not in legal jeopardy for uh, the things that you vote for. So, second paragraph from the end, it is no answer to this view of the case to say that these men are under oath to use their power only within certain limits. For what care they, or what should they care for oaths and limits when it is expressly provided by the Constitution itself that they shall never be questioned or held to any responsibility whatever for violating their oaths or transgressing those limits? And so I, I wrote my little Talebian thing, no skin in the game. So you go off to Washington and you spend years and years... You make yourself rich because they always end up rich. It's amazing how that happens. They make votes on things which benefit them. And they are never, the worst that you're called to account is you might get not elected. Yeah, or, or, or you get impeached. Who gives a shit? You know, an impeachment <laughs> is essentially the issue of demerit. Who cares? Like there is no honor at this point. You know, I can imagine there was a point where somebody brought an impeachment uh, charge against uh, someone, a uh, charge up in, in front of impeachment, that there would have been a duel. Like, we've had that, right? I mean, not over impeachment, mm -hmm. but, you know, Burr and Hamilton, you know, they're like, somebody's got to go because <laughs> there was honor. There isn't anymore. So, you know, censures, every other president's impeached now. It doesn't matter. Oh, they all will be. They all will be, ultimately. Well, actually, they won't because the conservatives won't actually do anything. So, uh, Well, they all should be. They all should be. <laughs> Each side should just try to impeach the other. Yeah. Um, and then they can't eat. They, then nothing they do can be brought before a court. Right. So they're just completely. Uh, I mean, know, he, he uses fraud. The term. You could be investigated for fraud or something, presumably. But, you know, your your vote to get us, your vote authorizing the Gulf War, you, you will not suffer for that. Just 
slap footed to just fucking lie about weapons of mass destruction. Cruise up to Hyannis Port, kick it in the Hamptons. It's fine. Yep. Harumph. He uses the term irresponsible in a way that we don't use it anymore. He says that these Congress people are irresponsible. Nowadays, I, I really liked this. Nowadays, irresponsible means uh, someone who won't take responsibility. You know, some kid is irresponsible. But for here, here he uses irresponsible to mean these are people who cannot be responsible. Mm-hmm. So they can do anything they want without consequence. It's a, it's a, it's a slightly different usage. I kind of liked it. Twitch there game. are there are some people that are in that sense irresponsible, kind of untouchable, right? We might use that now. Oh, he's untouchable. He can do anything he wants, and you know, Colin Powell he lays in state, and everybody weeps. He's a liar, but he was irresponsible in that respect. Nothing came of it for him. No, he was well. Either either he lied or he was gravely mistaken. And when was he called to account? I have too much respect for Did him to anybody think that he ever was mistaken. If he was mistaken, then he'd has to be dumb. Yeah, and and he's not dumb. He was not a dumb. I don't know. We got we got into that thing because of meth, weapons of mass destruction, and they never found him. Not only did and they not broke find the him, Middle East. they didn't mock up any hide him and produce him. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I mean, when I get in charge, that's what I'm going to do. I mean, Charles got weapons of mass destruction. And I'm going to go over there and take all your shit, and then I'm going to plant, uh, you know, a dirty bomb. I say, see, here it is. They didn't even do that. It's crazy, <laughs> crazy. So, no, but that's and, how you irresponsible know, uh, they are. Yeah, but you think, well, you know, not too many Americans died in those wars, so I guess they're okay. Yeah, it's fine. Well, well, well we don't conscript, so only Americans volunteers died. died. That plays right. a role. So too. they consented. Right. Right. So if you if you join the army, do you consent to all the actions of the army? In that case, yeah. They take an oath. They're sworn in. One by one by one. They do. Hmm. That's more so than you your voting makes your consent. Yes. Twenty four. A man is nonetheless a slave because he is allowed to choose a new master once in a term of years. Hmm. Yeah. I, does he ever? I'm just flipping back. I went back to the end. And in all of this rhetoric, I'm trying to remember when he provides an alternative. Well, you know, he doesn't. This is just a part of a series here, Carl. This is this is number six. Uh, and he wrote other stuff. This is just a little chunk. He he doesn't. This is just an impeachment, impeachment, uh, an indictment of the Constitution. Uh, you'll have to go into some other other spooner to see some of his other ideas. Uh, so he's not just a critic. Uh, you know, he's a doer, man. He set up the post office. He, you know, he supported abolitionist guerrilla movements. You know, he he did stuff. Mm-hmm. I wanted to point out one thing on this Civil War thing. This is page fifty four. Okay, notwithstanding all this that we had learned and known and professed for nearly a century, these lenders of blood money had, for a long series of years previous to the war, that's the Civil War, been the willing accomplices of the slaveholders in perverting the government from the purposes of liberty and justice to the greatest of crimes. That would be slavery. Been such accomplices for a purely pecuniary consideration, to wit, a control of the markets in the South, in other words, the privilege of holding the slaveholders themselves in industrial and commercial subjection to the manufacturers and merchants of the North who afterwards furnished the money for the war. And he, he goes on, they didn't quit buying cotton. The reason slavery flourished in the South was because it was good labor for the picking of cotton. If you are opposed to slavery, as you should be, as you should be, let me be clear, as you should be, then why are you wearing cotton in 1859? If you're opposed to sweatshops in Pakistan, then don't buy the clothing that's made there. But it's cheaper. 
I got to go to Walmart and get it cheaper. Okay, well, I guess you're in favor. You know, can we presume, in other words, this is a fascinating page here because it's taking the consent argument and applying it to the North and saying, you consented to slavery. If I consent to the government because I voted for it or I live here or any of the other arguments that are made or I pay taxes, well, then the Union consented to the slavery in the Confederacy before the war. Is this a bad take? In short, the North said to the slaveholders, if you will not pay us our price, give us control of your markets for our assistance against your slaves, we will secure the same price, keep control of your markets by helping your slaves against you and using them as our tools for maintaining dominion over you. For the control of your markets, we will have. Whether the tools we use for that purpose will be black or white, and be the cost in blood and money what it may. Uh, so, consent cuts a lot of ways. You know, once we start thinking about consent, well, then I can, I can plausibly accuse you of consenting to all sorts of things. If you're going to tell me that I consented to the United States Constitution, I don't have any place else to go. I'm not a revolutionary. But, you know, if you can say, in theory, I consented to this government because I live here, because I pay taxes, then, well, I can get a notebook and start writing down all the things you consent to. I think consent is probably the wrong way to go. I don't think it's about consent. I think it's William the Conqueror, you know, Ivan the Terrible, um, all these people. Yeah, men of power that made nations and we live in them and uh, do the best we can. What a good book. I mean, I don't think I agree with him on the nature of of government. It's not contractual. I, I'd have to read more and see what he proposes to put in its place. I love this as a work of rhetoric. It's very refreshing to read something by somebody who says exactly what he means and uses strong language and leaves no no doubt about it. It's It's so much fun. Uh, if only high school and college students wrote papers like this. I've read some of yours. I know that you do. I, I got to see some of your high school papers once. Yeah, I think there's some on scotthambert.com. In order to be a good writer, you have to know what it is you want to say. You know, Malachy in his Socratic Scribblings book and in his Socratic Scribblings... Which you can get. Which you can get at onlinegreatbooks.com. Um, and you can take the course yeah. at Online Great Books. Mal Malachi doesn't worry about grammar and uh, comma splices and all that stuff, which I make all the time. He doesn't worry about that. He, he says to be a good writer, you need to know what it is that you want to say. You have to ask yourself a bunch of questions so that you you know what the contents of your mind are. You need to ask a bunch of questions to figure out what it is that you're writing to and what's important to them and then meet that need with the contents of your mind that you've discovered, you know? Constitutional rights... Uh... They're, they're not this, they don't have metaphysical existence. You know, they, they don't have thingness, except to the degree that the people in the country are willing to not put up with their being violated. This is the problem with natural rights language. You know, uh, the Bill of Rights, there aren't any of those that I particularly disagree with. I don't disagree with them. But they don't subsist on their own. They're not substances. They're not this thing that's, they're not like a magic shield. Like, I'm, this is not Dungeons and Dragons, and I, and I create my shield of the Bill of Rights that floats around me and prevents attacks. It doesn't work that way. That's probably the nerdiest thing I've ever said. <laughs> but it's only because uh, a, a great mass of the country expects there to be freedom of speech and won't stand for there not being. Was the Constitution, I'll, I'll use some of these words, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hang up in my throat. Here I go. <laughs> Was the Constitution normative in 1789? Was it an expression of the mores and behavior and expectations of the people that were there already? Or was it performative in writing that down? Those things came to be and were then accepted by everyone, and et cetera. I don't know. I, I think probably the Bill of Rights is, is stuff that they expected to be true and had to guarantee it. So... That's why Madison proposes it. We have an internet friend who says that the Constitution was 
mm, the product of aristocratic property owners who were bristled up and armed to the teeth and intolerant of being tampered with. You know, it, it was it was already how the mm-hmm. Tidewater Virginia people behaved, and they wrote it down and somehow got the Adamses and the others to sign off on it. It became the law of the land. But huge huge chunks of the of the country already operate under those auspices. Yeah, it would endure if a, a sizable chunk of the people live that way, and if the governed was still a sizable chunk of those same kinds of people. Yeah. You know, the potato famine was an Aristotelian revolution. When those people... For who? Were, Ireland or the United States? Both. It changed who voted it, in those... It changed, it changed the constituencies of both of those countries more than the United mm-hmm. States than there. You know, you've got in 1830, the people of the United States were a certain kind of person. They had a certain kind of culture. They had certain kind of uh, history and upbringing and properties and so on. It wasn't a very populous place. Probably, I don't know, it's off the top of my head, 35 or 40 million people. You'd bring 100,000 Irishmen to Boston. More than that. Okay. A half a million Irishmen to Boston in New York City. And it is a political revolution. That can never be, well, it can. It actually can be overturned. Nobody's willing to do it. Well, Lincoln was, but but people aren't willing to do it anymore. It changed the whole character of the thing. Well, what you could do, so in order to maintain a nation as idea, which is a buzzword on, on the right, on certain aspects of the right, I think, you know, United States is an idea. I think Charlie Kirk says this, or has said it. Okay, if he were right, if if that's true, then when the new people come in, you have to get them to buy into the idea. So you, you actually have to believe in it. And you have to teach it as normative. You have to say, this is the way we live here. This is good. And if you don't do that, then your constitution can fail. Because the, the, the mass of the people won't support it. it. It's only going to endure if the people want it. Yeah, th- th- this this potato famine thing is fascinating. Nobody ever wants to talk about it because everybody's chicken. But you know, these, all these Irishmen uh, prior to the Civil it's War, one one quarter of my ancestry uh, and, is potato famine people. Oh my gosh, potato folk! And at that time, one of the ways that you could obtain citizenship was military service. The Union Army was swollen with Irish trigger pullers. Mm -hmm. I believe there were Irish draft riots in New York City. I think that's a thing. Yeah. But there were enormous numbers of those people who joined the Union Army. Now, was it because they had a dog in the fight or did they want the franchise? It's because the Scots-Irish do all the fighting all the time. Well, they like, well, okay, they like to fight. You're a racist. (laughs) And, <laughs> and but but they you know 1865 comes around these people get the franchise QED machine politics in New York City Chicago Kansas City and Boston and then and then you've got the Kennedys mm-hmm. and and Obama by the way like it's all machine politics and daily and whatever and and without the potato famine. Maybe you get corrupt politics, but not in that way. So the whole problem was the monoculture agriculture in Ireland. No. Darn it. No. It was open <laughs> borders. Yeah. Rut, rut. Well, they were going to go somewhere. I don't know where where they... I, I don't know where they were going to go they, either. Yeah. But But is that Tidewater Virginia's problem? Well, it became their problem. Mm-hmm. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. What are we going to read next? The Black Pill. With Carl Shoot. The Black Pill. I'm not so black pilled. I'm. I need a new pill. I yeah. don't think I'm white pilled. Um, potato pilled. 
you know, there's a lot of this that we didn't cover. Your potato. Uh, there's a lot of this that we didn't cover. Um, he makes a really good argument that without, uh, he doesn't say this explicitly because this wasn't, they were still on the gold standard at that time, but without the ability to mint money and print bond and issue bonds without usury, um, the tyranny that, that he saw from 1861 on wouldn't have been possible. You know, usury is usury used to be prohibited for some reasons, guys. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've got to go to the bank and borrow money to kill people, you're going to kill a lot fewer people. He puts forth that idea. Uh, he also impeaches the full faith and credit of the dollar. He doesn't do it in those wor words. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he says they have saved the country and preserved our glorious union. And that in now paying the national debt, as they call it, as if the people themselves, all of them who are tax payment, had really involuntarily joined in contracting it. They are simply maintaining the national honor. And he goes on and, and you realize, oh, oh yeah, that's a a <laughs> the full faith and credit is really the government's willingness to kill you if you don't pay the debt. What and and to what degree is the debt my debt? You know, uh, when they do quantitative easing and uh expand gosh or or uh, pass another continuing resolution to raise the debt ceiling, all of a sudden I'm in much more debt. When did I consent to that? Yep. It's Spooner is a dangerous thinker. Don't read him. Okay? Avoid him. Oh, Paul Krugman. Paul Krugman. Oh, the national debt. Your favorite person. The national debt is money you owe yourself. You can't go bankrupt. Well, good. I'm looking forward to the payments. Right. Yeah. <laughs> w when do I collect the interest that I paid myself, Craigman? Like, you know, Carl, the more I do this, this is a segue. Are you ready? The more I do this stuff, mm -hmm. all of the problems I see end up boiling down to metaphysical ones. Hmm. Krugman, Interesting. Krugman claiming that the national debt is debt that the nation owes itself is metaphysically not true. That's another whole other show to show the shark on that, but it's not true. He misunderstands the nation of debt. He misunderstands that uh, who, in fact, the lenders are. I don't know. Maybe he's not stupid. Maybe he's just a knave. Maybe he's a Spoonerian late knave. But all the problems with all the modern modern monetary theory are really metaphysical problems. And the more I read these things, the only stuff I want to read is about metaphysics. So mm -hmm. I had. So what are we going to read next? I had suggested that we read Edward Fesser's Scholastic Metaphysics, a contemporary introduction. I think is the tagline on the thing. Is that the title of it? Yes. How much of it? I say we just prologue. Although just the prologue, yeah, it's gosh, it's fifty something pages. He mounts a vigorous and violent metaphysical attack on scientism. In that, hmm. yeah, we can do that. Have you dove into that? Thing Basically, yet? Uh, I read five pages last night. Yeah, while I was waiting for Windows to update itself. Yuck! It did not successfully, but uh, the amount of years of my life I have wasted waiting for Windows to update. I could use a check from Bill Gates for that. Did I consent to that? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, that'd be good. We are vamping until and reading good and wholesome things until we both manage to finish volume one of Shelby Foot. I was out in public the other day at a doctor's office and another gentleman, he's staring at me. Why is this guy staring at me? You know, over his mask, because that's what we do here in Illinois. And finally, finally he says, because I had it under my arm, you like that Shelby Foot book? Yes, yes, very much. And now we're brothers. <laughs> he saw somebody else that was a reader out in public. Well, you could join our brotherhood too. You could join Online Great Books at onlinegreatbooks.com and read good stuff and talk about it. I had such a good seminar. I had, I want to talk about it a little bit. I had such a good seminar last night on the Odyssey. And I, I want to say this the right way. We talk about gatekeepers. There were a whole bunch of people in that seminar who would not have gotten through the gatekeepers. 
you know, they're not the right class. Uh, they got the wrong accent, the wrong profession, you know, and they're reading Homer and the insights were so good. These are ordinary folks reading things that most people tell them not to read. It was so good. I, I couldn't sleep until two o'clock last night because I, I was jazzed up from it. So well done. I believe it's seminar 76. I hope I don't get it wrong, but just fantastic. Yeah, and I, I did orientation for our new people last night, and it seems like a seems like a good group. They're going to have to talk more. That group, uh, but uh, they will, they will. And I read them the Riot Act because you know if you're going to do seminar, you've got to believe in a capital T truth, Carl. Mm-hmm. You don't have to believe anybody there has it, but uh, it's got to it's got to exist. You've got to believe it exists. We don't have to agree on what it is, and none of us have to have it necessarily, but we all have to believe there is such a thing, and we're all in pursuit of it. Uh, or otherwise, um, dialectic doesn't work. The seminar doesn't work. You've got to believe there's a capital T truth. And every time I do that, and I, and I tell them, hey, if you don't believe in, there, in a capital T truth, an objective truth, message me privately, and I will give you your money back, and you can keep the books, <laughs> and we'll go our separate ways. And I always lose a, fl a few. And I hold the door open because I don't want it to hit them in the rump as they leave. <laughs> well, it's honest of them to. That means actually they do believe in truth. Of course. They're just not ready to commit. Of course. Well, you know, if you want to re reconsider and come back, you just have, we might have to make you sign something. <laughs> yeah. Declaration mm -hmm. on the possibility of the acquisition of truth. Well, they need to grovel and show that they believe that there's such a thing as truth. <laughs> you know, we can't have any, we can't have any secret relativist agents in our program. <laughs> no, no. And, yeah. and here's why I'm it's, looking it, forward it, to the metaphysics. It, it's not even, okay. it's not even a political thing, although it is. <laughs> if you're in, if you're in seminar and you're talking about what is justice and there's somebody in there who doesn't believe in a, such a thing as an absolute truth, that person doesn't believe there's a thing such as justice. And so as you discuss it, they can never give an answer. All of their answers boil down to it depends. And you end up in this, this mm -hmm. infinite regress thing, thing where it always depends. And I think that, you know, maybe it does. Is such and such a guy who's on trial right now guilty? Well, it depends. But if you believe there's a, a, a objective truth, you can write down what all those, well, all those conditions are. And I'll tell you a secret, there is a lot that is revealed when you take a stand and make a judgment and say, I think this is true. Yep. Now things crystallize. Now we can see what follows from that. You might revise your opinion at some point, your judgment, but you got to make the judgment to see. You, you have to do it. Staying in, in, in uh, it depends land is, is no good. Take a stand. Maybe you're wrong. We'll fix it. But you got to take a stand. Oh, I'm always wrong. Like Spooner convinced me. Like I was a f a full gospel is. I mean, an artist, man. And after I read Aristotle and Plato and and some other things, and then you know walking the earth like Cain for fifty years, nearly. I mean, I I see that he's just wrong about contract. And um, while mm -hmm. he's right about the Constitution, he's. You know, he, he, he's wrong about the nature of government. And, and I, so I've changed my mind, and I've changed my mind about a lot of things and probably will continue to. And But I'm not changing my mind because there is no such thing as truth. I'm changing it because I hope I'm getting closer to it. I don't know. Right. I'm like Spooner, Absolutely. Carl. You going to have the kids read it? Uh, That's the real uh, test. Maybe. Might have, maybe John ought to read it. Not, not till they move out. <laughs> They're like, I didn't ask for this shit. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Who are you to tell me? I to never go to consented bed? to. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, I there... never consented to this dinner. There's an online great books podcast. Go check out No Treason Number Six: The Constitutional No Authority. You can get it on archive.org. It's uh, I think there's a link to it at the bottom of his Wikipedia page. You can get it anywhere. It's free, and you ought to read it. He's metaphysically wrong about the nature of government, though. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about metaphysics next on our next show. Uh, by the way, Christmas is coming. 
uh, there's a good chance that Carl and I take a little hiatus to finish up the foot book, to let Carl do a little traveling, and to uh, have an advent. So, uh, state, uh, we might skip a week, but uh, we'll be back. Fear not. Talk to you all soon.